What's up guys? It's yo boy Omni Sensei back with The Boys, Reborn as the Homelander, Part 4. If you enjoy my content, subscribe to the channel, like the video, share, and leave a comment. Remember to check out the author of this fantastic fanfic, link in the description. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. Date, June 2023 with Meve's son and well my son being born. I had an overwhelming urge to find out who my mother was. I suspected from all the fan theories who it was, but it was still good to verify. While there is a certain level of disgust I feel if Stormfront is my mother. I don't really care since she wasn't my mother. It would of course be some sort of fucked up poetic trope as the ancient gods themselves that married and fucked their own siblings since Homelander kind of viewed himself as a god among men. Nonetheless, I wanted to verify. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to find any records of Dear Mommy Digital or otherwise. That left me with only one avenue, which was why I was now entering Martin's office. Martin, I said loudly startling the man. He was focused on his computer likely going over the latest reports on 24 volt and probably a dozen other things. The man was gobbling up the increased R and D budget at an unfathomable pace. John, how are you this morning? Doing well, thank you. I have one question for you. I said getting to the point and piquing the man's interest. Who is my mother? I saw him blink absorbing my question, then his features softened into sadness, and he deflated into his chair. His heart spiked, and a small release of sweat happened as his temperature grew a bit too suddenly. Martin, I pressed. He took a breath and looked at me. Are you sure you want to know? You won't like it. Bingo. And also fuck. I said loudly. I was only partially faking my outrage. I knew IT. Of course it's her. Who else could it be? That fucking nutsy bitch. How could she? Oh god the things we did. An adequate show had to be put on. The new Homelander had to show at least some level of disgust and remorse. Martin looked at me confused. It's fucking Stormfront isn't it? Martin blinked. What? My mother is Stormfront right? What? No. He looked even more confused. Why would you think that? Now I was confused. You take her flight and energy manipulation I said raising my right hand. You add soldier boy's ridiculous super strength and invulnerability I said raising my left hand. You add them together. I bring both hands together in clap. And you get me. I could see Martin thinking things over for a second. Yes, I can see how that would make sense. But no, it's not her, he said firmly. Then who could it possibly be? Tell me. I it might be better if you leave this secret buried. It will only make things worse. Oh now I was deadly curious. I came in here prepared to hear it was Stormfront or some random crack whore or something like that. But he was making sound like it was worse. Martin. I said as I slowly approached his desk. Tell me. Now. I saw him swallow and then he opened his mouth. Well your surrogate mother was a woman named Maria Avro. She's the one that carried you to term. She died in the birth. But she is not my mother. So they used someone else's egg with Soldier Boy's seed. Yes. He said and I waited for him to elaborate. It's Catherine then he hesitated. Bojelbom. My world tilted. My chest felt constricted by a knotted chain. The world muted as my brain processed the name. Catherine Bojelbom a sudden flurry of emotions all acted at once and a surge of energy exploded from the pit of my stomach. That fucking Nazi son of bitch. How could he? How fucking could he? A rage like I never felt before engulfed me. I briefly felt something get squished as my hands scrunched into fists, shaking, trembling with rage. I L L kill him. How could he do this to me? I'll dig up his corpse and piss on him. My vision turned red. How could he do this to me? That sick fucking German Nazi piece of shit. I was breathing heavily now. I felt like I could not get enough air. HN. I barely heard a whisper. Ot dot own. Everything was red. I felt heat and energy build inside of me and the faint whisper again. Ot dot own. Why I everything red? I need to calm down. I take a breath and exhale slowly. John. I hear loudly as I regain my sense. I look in front of me. Martin isn't there. His desk I crushed before me. In my hands I hold smush pieces of it. The wood turned into compressed smush from the pressure. John please you have to calm down. Or you'll blow us all up. I turned to see a frightened Martin by the door. I realized I was glowing in eerie red aura. A few seconds more and I would have blown up like Soldier Boy. I take another breath to reel in the energy back into myself. I won't blow us all up Martin. Now tell me what happened. He came back into the office after dispatching the other curious co-workers. That came to see what the commotion was all about. Catherine and her husband had trouble conceiving. Jonah performed the in vitro procedure for them. It was during this process that he harvested her eggs. I don't know why he used her, but I can tell you she never knew about you, and Jonah never wanted her to find out. 
He paused, but he looked like he wanted to continue. So I let him. He erased all records around the time you were seven years old. He swore all of us to secrecy, threatened us. Seven years old. That was around the time Homelander started killing his caretakers, masking them as accidents, just to see if he could to see if he could get Jonah's attention. His affection. John, I'm sorry. I said it would have been best if we leave this buried. The man said and I know he felt sad, but also pity for me. I'm sorry Martin, I need to go. I said after a moment of silence. It was hard to process and I really did need to go. Homelander's emotions were strong. I was me, but I was also him with all the memories and feelings he's ever had. All the fame and adoration, all the insecurities and needs, all the pain and damage Vought put him through growing up. It was no wonder Vogelbaum had been Vought's successor. All the physical but mostly the emotional pain damage Jonah inflicted on his own blood on his own kin. With no remorse, only aiming for results. But worst of all the fucking piece of shit had withheld from Homelander the one thing he earned. To have real connections, a real family. Catherine Vogelbaum was Jonah's younger sister. And I was Jonah's nephew, flesh and blood. But in his eyes all I had ever been was a product. Date. July 2023 Cameron saw the conference room doors burst open as Ashley walked in like a fiery hurricane. The mini-me trailing behind her, struggling to juggle an assortment of phones, laptop, coffee mug and paper files. A deadly combination in his opinion, one small step and it all comes crashing down. Is he there yet? The Vought CEO asked the room at large. He could feel the exasperation in her tone. Not yet, I mean he hasn't called back. Nor have we seen him on TV. Shauna, the head of legal, answered promptly. Christ, what the fuck was he thinking? None answered, they all knew the question was rhetorical. What about Starlight and A-Train? They are on site helping with the town evacuation. Sharon, the chief emergency disaster coordinator, pitched in. Shock with Racer and Blink should be there pretty soon 15, maybe 20 minutes tops if they aren't there already. But Inferno and Bright Flame are about an hour away. While torture, fireworks and sparks are all around 2 to 3 hours away. Great some 2-bit rate speedsters and a bunch of C-listers that can barely hold a candle lit. Those idiots are more likely to burn downtown themselves. Cameron saw her sigh. At least Inferno and Bright Flame are competent if the town actually catches fire. Otherwise they'll all be left standing there looking like schmucks holding their dicks in their hand. She said with annoyed exasperation, as her eyes stared intently on the images on TV, showing the raging Inferno that was the California Massive Forest Fire. Then turned to the table at large. Cameron saw everyone in the room give a concerned look. What? Ashley asked annoyed and rolled her eyes. It's not like I want the town to actually catch fire. It will still be great PR. Taylor the head of marketing added inches quote brave heroes. Help evacuate the town. Emmy Colin Vought acts fast. Sends the fastest team. She said with a tone of excitement, we can spin this a thousand and one ways. Ashley looked at her unconvinced as she took her seat at the head of the giant conference table. It's also very, very likely the town will catch fire. Sharon interjected before Ashley could respond. Our analytics show that at the rate the fire is spreading, and due to wine conditions, it will likely be within the next two hours. It's probably why they ordered the evacuation two hours. Minnie Ashley asked with her hands now free from the impending disastrous clutter. There's like over 60,000 people in that town is that going to be enough time to get everyone out? Cameron felt the room go quiet once more. Unlikely but they don't need to get everyone out at the same time. They likely started with the neighborhoods closest to the forest and worked their way backwards from there that will likely give them enough time and keeping the streets clear. Sharon added reluctantly. Rhonda their head of legal almost snorted as her eyes were still on her phone. Like that ever works. ENN's been reporting massive traffic jams on all ways out of the area. She said and brought her phone to show the report to the table. Ashley sighed deeply. Great this is likely going to be a disaster. She paused as everyone looked at her. For both us and the town obviously. Homeland is rushing in half cocked with god knows what plan we can only hope he plays it safe for the cameras. Ashley said. And he felt the chord of annoyance in her tone reverberating strongly. Cameron thought it understood. Understandable. While natural disasters were their bread and butter, they required planning and coordination both for operational effectiveness, picking which soups to go where and coordinating with the local authorities, and also for getting the maximum media and PR boost. Cameron saw Sharon respond. While Homelander hasn't coordinated with us as it would be standard procedure in these cases, we can speculate from the heroes he's mobilized that he likely means to act as emergency evacuators. He and the speedsters could rush anyone critical to a hospital while the pyrokinesis suits can contain the fires as they spread around the town. She said comfortably. It's really the only logical thing they can do it's not like he can fight the forest fire itself. She said shrugging her shoulders. And my team is already working on various scenarios and are prepping material as we speak. Taylor said confidently. Well, that's good. Ashley said resigned as her gaze moved her eyes back to the giant TV on the far side wall. A few moments passed as they watched in a connected silence. 
the aerial view of the ever-expanding fire. As they watched the smoke dance on the screen, Cameron felt a genuine solemn moment with his fellow co-workers. A permeating pain when faced with the truth that nature still ruled the world. That even with all their power and accomplishments, it could all literally go up in smoke. A connectedness of the human experience. Ashley broke this feeling. Cameron why the fuck are we watching this on MSNBC? Ah right so our helicopter is undergoing maintenance. And we weren't able to secure a replacement. And our ground teams should be just about setting up. We're scheduled to go live in 15 with Terry and Laura. Cameron replied with confidence. The answer seemed to mollify Ashley. But Cameron couldn't help but wonder if she's just holding back her bite for their next stress relief session. Their little on and off again relationship had slowed down as they both had been swamped with work. But while the sessions had become rarer, they had become that much more intense. One small problem. He continued as Ashley and the rest of the room turned back towards him. They are blocking access to most of the town outside of emergency vehicles for safety reasons. So our team might be stuck on the outskirts. But so would everyone else's right? Asked Shauna. His features scrunched in response. Not exactly if they were already there before they blocked access and they can stay until the sector is evacuated. And let me guess that's where our heroes are, Rhonda asked. He answered as both him and Sharon nodded at the same time. Yes, for the most part. They all watched Ashley sigh. So I guess it is CNN and MSNBC all the way. Cameron couldn't help but reluctantly nod. Starlight watched the screens in the command tent, as they showed a steady stream of cars moving slowly but surely all heading out of the city like a viscous sluggish stream of blood. There wasn't much they could do well, there wasn't much he could do. A train and the other speedsters Shockwave, Racer and Blink could all technically run people to the nearest hospital over 50 miles away technically because practically if anyone was in that dire danger, they likely wouldn't survive the trip. Still nonetheless in a pinch they could help even if it was a risk, while her power set didn't really help much outside of going into an actual burning building to pull someone out. So with a lack of ability to help outside of lending her face and fame to make a few announcements, there really wasn't much for her to do other than watch the screens, and try not to be in anyone's way. She sensed that the fire chief wasn't too thrilled with them being here, and was making it obvious he was doing this as a favor to the governor. Annie thought likely that Vought had helped in his election campaign. But then again she knew Vought donated to both sides of the aisle. Her gaze turned to A-Train talking with the other speedsters. Shockwave was A-Train's main rival as the mid-twenties man had been considered as his replacement on the Seven. Racer was an older gentleman in his sixties from the Midwest. She remembers hearing about him maybe fifteen or twenty years ago when she was a child herself. Blink was new. He didn't look older than fifteen, and she didn't remember him from Vought's rosters. Rosters she had recently gotten to know quite intimately as she and A-Train had been in charge of the whole retraining project. A mammoth task had had just recently been completed. Starlight took in Blink's appearance and judged by the costume or more like lack of costume, since it was nothing more than blue and green spandex shorts and shirt, usually worn by cyclists topped off with sleek goggles, that were currently hanging off his neck revealing his brown eyes. That he wasn't one of Vort's or any of the other lower agencies. This made her think it was just some boy with powers that decided to play hero. His excitement evident as he was talking with the older speedsters. But it also made her question what the hell was Homelander thinking calling him. And how the hell did he even know about the kid? She and a train had been shooting a commercial in La. When the call from Homelander came asking them to meet here. Of course she had been surprised since responses to these types of natural disasters would usually be pre-planned and involve the emergency disaster coordination team, both for Vought to deploy its resources effectively and to stay on top of the PR game. Where they went so did the cameras. This of course had been rushed and with no cameras in sight, no coordination of where to go from head office and a fire chief that wanted nothing more than to throw them out. They were stuck holding the bag so to speak, waiting for Homelander to come with his grand plan. She hoped he wouldn't be too long, because even though she had not been included in the fire response command structure, she could tell tensions were rising, and she could see from the TV, that the fire was spreading faster and faster as new plumes of smoke rose in thick spots that were previously green and clear. The clogged streets didn't give her a feeling of confidence the evacuation will be finished in time not to mention the fact that most of the roads going out of town were surrounded by forest as well. A train was bored. He'd been in a commercial shoot with Starlight when they got the call to rush them both halfway across the state to help out. Only there wasn't much help they could give as the evacuation was in progress, and it was obvious the man in charge didn't like them. His first instinct had been to leave and let the emergency personnel handle this whole thing, but Homelander had told them to wait for him there, and he wasn't about to go against Big Blue. Homelander had certainly changed in the past year, but one thing was still crystal clear, insubordination was not tolerated. Some of the rowdier soups that had mouthed off during the retraining project, had already felt the brunt of HL's displeasure. Not a pretty sight. Surprisingly no casualties. But for some it might as well be the end of their careers. Some injuries weren't really recoverable. He'd seen Noir do some nasty stuff to some of them hell. 
he had to apply some of the accidents himself. Outside of his own personal fear, there was also the fact that Vought and by extension Homelander, were creating the potential cure for his brother's paralysis. An event he wholly blamed himself for. He knew it was likely a long shot no matter what Homelander or the science nerds said. But he still had to have hope, he still needed to make things right for himself, for his brother, and most of all for his nephew and niece. It was how they looked at him now that hurt him the most. He'd been their hero, and now he was less, less than a hero. Less than an uncle, less than even a family member. Their excitement to see him was gone. They wouldn't really talk to him. They treated him like a stranger like someone to stay away from. It hurt him more than anything else he'd done so far. He couldn't bear how they looked at him. He had to make things right. So no slacking off for him. If Big Blue told him to jump he'd ask how high. And if he told him to run, he'd only ask where and how fast. And if he told him to drop everything and rush halfway across the state to help he would. Still with no cameras in sight, a command tent that was obviously annoyed to have to put up with them there. He'd wisely let Starlight deal with that she was captain after all, and not a lot of coordination of where to go, and what to do there really wasn't much for him to do. He was both annoyed and relieved when the other speedsters showed up. Annoyed that he would now have to share the limelight, and relieved that he had someone else to talk to. Shockwave was his friendly rival in the media, and he knew the younger man had been the first pick as his replacement on the 7, still he couldn't hold it against him, the guy was a bro trying to reach the top. Racer he knew from when he was young in his career and even looked up to the older speedsters at one time. It was always a pleasure to talk to the mild-mannered man, though he was somewhat bland, likely due to his Midwest upbringing and persona. Blink on the other hand was new. The kid wasn't with Vought, but that didn't stop him from venturing out into superheroing antics on his own in his native San Diego. A train could tell the kid was very excited to be here, especially having received a call from Homelander personally. Why Big Blue called a non-Vought affiliated soup, especially one so young, was beyond him. Definitely not standard procedure. The only thing he could think of was that Homelander was trying to recruit the kid. But even then there were official avenues and procedures to go through. Still it wasn't up to him to question the big guy. He'd leave that to Starlight. As he listened to Racer and Blink exchange stories, A-Train couldn't help but think back to how things had changed in the team. Working with Starlight had been good for both of them. He'd let her take the lead on the project at first, thinking he might be able to skate by with a few appearances. But soon enough found out that she drove hard and was on his ass constantly. She held him to deadlines and hadn't let him slack off. He'd attended every meeting, every storm braining session, met with every vendor, read all the materials, no matter how boring they were, and put in all the late nights that were required. Between the projects, his training sessions with Ryan and all his other hero responsibilities, he'd had little time to himself and to his family. He sighed inwardly as he thought it was probably for the best, since relations were strained. Still overall he felt quite proud of all that he'd achieved in the last year. A part of him thought for sure Homelander will take all the credit for the retraining project, but surprisingly, he'd been very hands-off. Though, maybe he shouldn't have been surprised considering Homelander's space project, Vought responsibilities and raising Ryan. His thoughts were interrupted by the landing of the big guy himself. Shock with Racer, Blink. Glad you could make it. Homelander said addressing the other speedsters first. A chorus responded. Hey Homelander. Shockwave said with a nod. Glad to be able to help. Racer said calmly. Sir. Homelander sir. Blink added excitedly. A train. Homelander said turning to him. What's the situation? Starlight's in the command tent. Guy in charge goes by Nelson Bricks isn't fond of us being here. Barely tolerates us. Our guys at Vought haven't been very helpful either since their teams can't get through. They were caught dash. We won't get much help from them. He interrupted A-Train. This was impromptu on my call it will take them some time to work through the official channels. It's just us here. We'll have to coordinate and work with the emergency personnel ourselves dash. A-Train saw he stopped and looked past him. Starlight was approaching with the fire chief. Starlight. Homelander. She said in acknowledgement. This is Chief Nelson Bricks. Chief. Homelander said shaking the man's hand. Homelander. The pudgy chief said, a bead of sweat rolling no his temple. We are here to help. A train was catching me up on the situation, but I would like to hear it from the experts. Homelander said with command in his tone. A train saw that the fire chief was not too happy about it, but let it go. We've got a 10 mile front all on the length of the town, fire is spreading quicker and quicker. The drought hasn't been helping. I've got everyone and everything doing all they can to slow the spread. But overall I give it about 45 minutes before we get into the danger zone. He said with reluctant confidence. And the evacuation. I saw from above the roads are all packed. Closest neighborhoods to the forest were first to go. But the way the wind is blowing and the rate the fire is moving, it might not be quick enough. Once the houses catch fire it will burn through the neighborhoods quick. And even the roads going out are forested on the sides. He stopped briefly. The smoke is the real killer. Once the fire reaches town the smoke will infest everything. It will be really bad for anyone trapped on the road. He stopped once more as the sound of his walkie-talkie went off. A train saw the man say a few words to his colleagues over the walkie-talkie, then turn back to their group. Inferno and Bright Flame should be here soon 10 or 15 minutes. 
Homelander said that pyrokinetic abilities should be able to help contain any fire that starts within the town as long as they get to it in time. We could also dash listen. Chief Nelson interrupted Homelander. I know you guys mean well, but we all know there isn't much for you to do now. This is serious business not a PR stunt. People's lives and homes are at stake. Let us professionals take care of it. Let us do our jobs and don't get in the way. He paused briefly once more and looked Homelander directly in his eye. The only reason I'm even allowing you here is because I owe one to the governor. Now all I ask is that you let us handle this and stay out of the way. Your presence here is distracting enough. And I know sooner or later your little corporate stooges will want the cameras to be present, creating even more distractions. A train had to admit the man was Balsy. He even stepped off and didn't let Homelander to respond. Then again the pudgy fire chief didn't know the real Homelander, only the media version. Wait. Homelander said to the fire chief, the evacuation what if we can give you more time we can slow the spread maybe even contain it. Chief Nelson turned around. How? What if we could make a firewall make a clearing and remove everything flammable? How big would it have to be? You'd need a containment line of about 30 feet wide. If we take into consideration the height of some of the trees, maybe a 50 foot clearing overall. But you'd have to do it over 10 miles in under 30 minutes. That's impossible. Leave that to us. Homelander said confidently. We'll take care of it. The chief just looked at him for a tense moment and gave in. Fine. As close as you can to the fire line is better. Got it. A train saw Homelander turn back to them. Starlight, you racer and blink stay here and wait for Inferno and Bright Flame to arrive. Coordinate with the chief on containing any fires if needed. And help with the evacuation in any way possible. Then he turned to Blink. Blink, can I trust that you will follow Starlight and the emergency personnel's lead? Yes sir of course. The 15 year old said excitedly. Excellent. We'll speak once all this is over. A train you and Shockwave are with me. He said and sped off giving them no chance to protest. Had they not been soups the heat and smoke would have been overwhelming. They soon stopped and were now maybe a few hundred yards away from the fire line. Not that it was a straight line. A train saw that Homelander had stopped and looked all around in silence, with only the crackling of fire being heard. A train would bet that Big Blue was using his supervision, if he was a betting man which he was. Homelander what's the plan here man? Shockwave asked. It took a moment for Homelander to respond. We'll start making a clearing from here heading north along the fire line. I want every tree in a 50 foot radius to be taken down and pushed back. He pointed towards the town. We'll make sure to starve the fire once it reaches here. What? How? There's no way we can do that. Shockwave asked shocked. A train saw Homelander look at Shockwave like he was a child. Shockwave you are super strong, super fast and incredibly durable. Push, punch, rip them out or cut them. Homelander said as he lifted his left arm and started oscillating it back and forth in short movements going faster until it was a blur. The vibrating arm cut right through a tree like a hot knife through butter. A train was amazed. Wow, Shockwave was too. I don't think I can do that. The younger speedster said as he lifted his hand and tried to vibrate it the same way with mixed sputtering results. Yes you can, Homelander said forcefully. And if you can't you will learn now. He said as he closed the distance between them and grabbed Shockwave by the shoulder. You heard the fire chief. People's houses and lives are at stake and you are a hero. Not because of your powers. But because in a time of crisis you step up to the plate. You understand? Homelander continued, his tone was dangerously low. In contrast to the positive pep talk, a train could also tell that Homelander was squeezing Shockwave's shoulder just a bit too hard for comfort. We'll handle it, he said suddenly out of guilty interrupting Big Blue's intimidating pep talk. What about you? What are you going to do? Me. Homelander turned to him. I'm going to make a trench. It will be the line you two will follow to clear the area. Now a train was confused. How are you going to do that? He asked before he could stop himself. To his surprise Homelander smiled at them and unclasped his cape throwing far away to the side. By digging of course. Before he could continue his line of questioning, a train saw Homelander hover above their heads in the air. To both of their surprise they saw Homelander switch position almost horizontal body slightly angled, so that it's not completely flat. Next Homelander moved his hands above his head looking like a diver, but with hands clamped together. He stood her in that position for half a moment, then he started spinning. Within a moment he was spinning so fast he was blurry. And within a blink of an eye, a train saw Homelander plunge into the ground. The sound was deafening. What the fuck? He heard the younger speedster's voice his exact thoughts. Dirt, rock, trees, everything was pulverized or thrown out of place, with only a shallow trench left in place. The ground might as well have been putty against the force that was Homelander. He'd never seen anything like it. He didn't even know Homelander could do that. His thoughts were broken by the younger speedster. What do we do? A train looked at him and focused. Like Big Blue said, we clear out everything. He's the bulldozer with a clearing team. Scene break. Minnie Ashley opened her mouth to make a sound, but nothing came out. She remained slack-jawed. It appears that massive trail of destruction is Homelander, along with Shockwave and A-Train. She heard the TV say over the practically yelling voices of the executives. He could do that. How come we didnt know this? 
My god it's like a drill through jello. That wasn't in his files. How come we didn't know he could do that? I didn't know either. She barely registered the voice of her boss. Do you think he can do that through solid rock? He can crush steel like paper, so probably. How come we never used men of steel? She watched with morbid fascination as the tale of destruction split the forest, pulverizing everything in its path at astonishing speed, as if someone was drawing a black line on a canvas of green, the helicopter moving fast to keep everything in frame. Two blurs trailing behind cutting trees and chucking debris at also impressive speeds. Copyright, there's another soup. The exec's conversation continued all around her. If he could do that to the new bypass line being built. If only we were so lucky we could have it built this century. Ha! Huh. Tired of sitting in traffic. She heard a sarcastic voice, likely Rhonda's. We get who we vote? Four mini Ashley shook her head and tried to clue him back to the conversation. Everyone was cracking jokes. But she could tell Ashley was thinking deeply and plotting. Date. August 2023 Mallory felt bored indifference as she watched the analyst go over the video of Homelander turning the forest floor into Play-Doh. Up and down the 10 mile length four times in under 45 minutes. She fought the urge to slouch and yawn only out of sheer professionalism as everyone present, every agent, special agent, lieutenant, analyst, special analyst and all other fancy useless titles were sitting straight as rods absorbing or pretending to absorb every single word. If we consider the additional trenches on the sites to contain the fire, then it becomes much. Mallory also felt old as she looked around the conference table at the faces that made up this little task force. Oh, the higher-ups were around her age sure, but everyone else was 20 years younger at least. Not a bad thing necessarily. New blood was always good, hopefully new ideas and new perspectives. The sheer destruction capabilities in such a short amount of time means we have two updated R. She was supposed to be retired. But it seemed there was always something that pulled her back in. The government had always kept a close eye on Homelander. Well at least when the extent his capabilities started to sink into the brains of the national security types. She knew there were contingencies in place, plans to secure VIPs the president, cabinet, important senators and other types, in case Big Blue finally snapped. She didn't know what they were specifically, but she knew there was nothing like a politician trying to save their ass. Yes, yes enough about updating the damn Matrix response level. Special Director Bart Brown interrupted the presentation. Special Director because the only thing he was directing was this task force which officially didn't exist, and technically no one on it was his direct employee, technically. Practically he could make or break most of these people's careers. One word from him and off to Antarctica you go for bird watching. What I want to know is how come we didn't know about this. I thought we knew all his capabilities. He asked the room at large. Well sir, the analyst or was it special analyst or was it senior analyst? She couldn't remember and frankly didn't care. Technically he's not using any new powers he's just applying his current powers differently. It's just an application of his flight powers and incredible durability. Though we suspect his super and laser vision as well. And how come he's never done this before? We've had other terrible forest fires we certainly could have used his help. One of the NSA reps asked. We don't know for sure. The analyst said shrugging his shoulders. In the interviews he puts blame on the previous Vought leadership not letting him. Though we suspect it's more likely tied to the changes he underwent in the past year. Which brings us to the other part of this little meeting, Brown said. The psychological and behavioral changes we've observed Johnson. Mallory almost snorted. Thank you sir. Another middle-aged man buzz cut man said standing, while the previous analyst took a seat. There were at least four Johnsons in this room alone. Why the agencies attracted people with that name was beyond her. In the past year we've observed an increased focus of obsessive behavior focused on work priorities, both in the hero and corporate sides. Were they all just trying to prove something to make up for something lacking? Or did they feel that because of their names, they could fuck the common folk by being spooks? Surprising competence in running Vought operations coupled with metaphorically of course. Not that the CIA hadn't fucked America before. Christ, the things she did for this agency all in the name of national security. What a load of crap. Since she would never wash out. While showing restraint and exhibiting less narcissistic traits, she was practically responsible for the crack epidemic in black communities. Well, not only her alone, the agency at large, but she had a deadly hand in it. They didn't even let them traffic cocaine, but crack instead. All to make more money, to fight the commies. What a joke she thought. They sold their souls for something as pitiful as money. The Soviets who were paper bears to begin with. While more stable and less likely to have an episode, we believe that this change in personality, coupled with new application of his powers, and that was only the crap she was directly involved. The other Black Ops nonsense she had at least indirectly touched would fill a whole graveyard of skeletons, let alone a closet. Which is why we continue to recommend a hands-off approach of only observation and cleanup for both Homelander and Dash this time. Mallory actually snorted out loud. His son. The analyst finished looking at her. The whole room was looking at her. Mallory got something to add. Brown asked with a scowl on his mouth. Oh, nothing she started with derision. She was old and she wasn't even supposed to be here anymore. There was nothing Brown could do to her outside of killing her. Just that we had the perfect opportunity to take out Homelander over a year. 
Egoshi said looking around the room. But in true government fashion the operation was botched from the beginning. She immediately saw some of the gathered men puff up in indignation. That was an unsanctioned, unauthorized operation by rogue agents. Justice and disciplinary action were swiftly applied upon their capture. One of the other Johnsons said, Oh, cut the bullshit. You had the chance of a lifetime and botched it. She was tired of the games, and she was tired of the amateur bullshit. You all knew what Noir was capable of. And you went in half-cocked and under armed you should have dash. What the hell were we supposed to do? The other man exploded his face red. Bring down the whole fucking building. Hundreds if not thousands more could have died. She felt bitter inside. He was right of course. But she couldn't stop feeling the bitterness. Leave it to the agency to grow fucking heart now. Where was this when pregnant women were dying of crack? Or when armed guerrilla fighters raped their way through and installing banana dictators? You do what it takes. You finish the fucking dash bang. The loud noise startled them all. Enough. Brown yelled. If you don't have anything constructive to say then keep quiet. Both of you. Mallory saw the other man relent and lean back in his chair while she rolled her eyes. Now if we are done with the psych profile we move on to the next topic. Brown said his gaze intense. The presenter sat down. Mallory, please, your report. She hated this. Not because she was technically spying on Ryan but because of what she had to report. Ryan is doing well and as far as I can tell he is developing as a normal child for that age would. Homelander has, and she hated to say admit this proven to be a competent parent. His approach to Ryan has been well thought out, and in line with what would be considered a normal working parent. If anything I would say he is being somewhat strict. She paused and took a breath. He has restricted access to social media and the internet in general. It seems Homelander wants him to have as little screen time as possible. His days are filled mostly with tutors trying to bring his academic level. Like every kid ever he both hates it and likes it. He'd rather play video games than do homework. She paused once again. Is he adjusting well to the new situation? Are they getting along well? Is he happy? One of the old timers asked. She knew what he was getting at. Can Ryan be used against Homelander or is he turning into him? He is adjusting as well as any kid could in this situation. His complaints about his father are she really hated to say this trivial in nature, typical of what any kid would have. Their overall relationship I would say is pretty good. I doubt any plans to turn him away from his would work at this point. And his powers. This time Brown asked. He practices them regularly with Homelander. I'm sure you've all seen him break the sound barrier in under 12 seconds. A chorus of nods was the response from the room. He loves flying and likes to practice it the most. Homelander has put him through various training programs at Vought to help him control his increasing strength. He's undergoing combat training with Noir and speed training with A-Train. He even spent a few sessions with Silver Kincaid. He says Homelander makes him regularly do target practice with his laser vision. She couldn't help but smile at her next sentence. Says he's better since his father is missing and I. Hopefully that will be enough to keep the body count down, Brown said. The rest of the room agreed with him and she did as well. Ryan was growing fast, and so were his powers. She could barely compare him to how he was when they were together. Back then he could scarcely use his powers both because he was afraid of what he could do, and because he didn't know how to do it. Though it was also likely because he was now a year older and thus more grown up and stronger overall. We will have to adjust our contingencies to take him into consideration as well. Mallory didn't like the sound of that but knew it was necessary. While she couldn't see Ryan turning into his father, it didn't mean that the boy wouldn't help his father, whether it would be out of love or manipulation. The possibility is still there. Anything else to report? Brown asked pointedly. No, she said coldly. Nothing else. That is all she will give them for now. Not that there was much else to report, outside of Ryan's wish to attend school. But fuck them, she thought let the others earn their paycheck. Good. And the last thing on the agenda. Brown said moving things along. We have an update on Compound V research facilities across the globe. Becca take it away. Ever since the idiot Homelander spread V around the globe to terrorist cells, it was only a matter before countries got their hands on them and started their own research facilities. As discussed in our last presentation out of the nations of concern, China and Iran have managed to synthesize stable formulas and are approaching human trials if they haven't already started. What an imbecilic move that was, she thought. The idiot might have doomed them all. God only knows what commies or the religious nutjobs will do with the ash fell on her skin. Dark clouds illuminated by the red hue of the wildfire blanketed the sky. Light covered her face, and a mingling of voices carried by shadowy figures moving all around filled her ears. She blinked, it felt like an eternity. Two men were on the floor breathing heavily. Their colorful costumes were torn, burnt and melted, their skin glistening with sweat and dirt. Another blink another eternity. She felt his presence. He descended from the sky, hair wild and dirty. His costume gone, his cape wrapped around his waist. An avalanche of heat engulfed her as he landed. He leaned in. His scars seemed to ripple in the red tinted light. 
Her heart skipped and she blinked, less than an eternity. She saw metal walls and felt pressure in her stomach. She was scared. A canine smile and sharp blue eyes met hers. Not one but two. They were cold and furious. His face was unmarked perfect. She blinked again, faster than an eternity. Two eyes turned into one, boring down on her. She felt heat. He'd just landed. Her heart skipped again. She blinked, faster this time. A mocking smile met her. It was cold. She blinked, the image changed again. She felt heat. He was landing again. His gaze only on her and hers on him. She blinked. Blood drip drop splashing. Locking her viewers is falling on a screen in front of her. Alex's face flashes in front of her and then the disembodied parts. Ah. She wakes with a scream. Her chest is heaving heavily, and she's covered in sweat. She only hopes she hadn't messed the power to the tower this time. Every time she's had this dream her powers had activated and something had blown up somewhere. She regained her breath and steadied herself. A dream? No. This was a nightmare. How can she possibly think of him, of all people, like that? The heat was more than just from the fire. Dina watched with curious fascination through the giant glass walls. How Homelander was aggressively flailing around a plethora of diapers, closing and opening them, while gesticulating wildly towards the crowd, in what could only be anger and frustration. She wasn't the only one watching of course, everyone was doing their best to be inconspicuous from their desks. But she was the only one actually standing outside the giant see-through glass of the boardroom walls. That was only of course because she was early for the Seven's weekly stand-up meeting. Normally they would use the Seven meeting room on the top floor however, Homelander had made it an unofficial policy to once in a while schedule their meetings in other floors of the company, so the employees can see us. His reasoning was, smart move she thought. It's always good to connect with the rest of the company, the rest of the people. Ever since she joined the Seven she'd seen a lot of smart moves not only from Vought, but specifically Homelander. He wasn't quite the man she'd seen in Meave's memories. Though he could simply be doing a better job at hiding it or, as maybe as Meave said, and something was wrong with him. Today's meeting wasn't one of those smart moves. The video conferencing system had crapped out in the Seven meeting room, so they had to reschedule to a different room. Whatever was happening was bad. Well bad enough that Homelander was actually throwing a fit in public. Hey Silver Kincaid. She was broken out of her thoughts. Any idea what is going on in there? Golden Boy asked. No clue. She said looking at the golden costumed young man. He was Meave's maternity leave replacement fresh out of Godolkin. The newbie settled into a crossed arm position next to her. She had to admit, he looked good, no not just good he looked golden. Top of the class at go to graduating one year early with honors. Dean's list, the works, and with charm and looks. That made him a teenage girl's wet dream. It was another smart move by Homelander to snatch him up early. It's 7 past 10. He said slowly. Should we go in there or is our meeting cancelled? Before she could answer she saw Homelander turn to them and motion for them to join the room. Guess their meeting is over. She said and opened the door. But Homelander wasn't actually done talking. Well don't care how they either change their production or we change supplier. I don't care how much it costs. She saw him say to Josh the head of product for Queen Meave as a portion of the room shuffled out. There are contracts we'd be breaking here. We can't simply change it on a dime. And even if we can make a change this fast, there's already hundreds of thousands if not millions of units shipped. We'd have to dash no, no, no. Homelander answered frustrated. I don't want to hear this. We've already had this meeting with the ELT and the board. Everything related to the Seven has to be of superior quality. No generic crap, and especially, and I cannot stress this enough, everything related to Queen Meave's baby brand. Things that we are charging an atrocious amount of premium on. He paused briefly. These are good quality diapers. Josh said defensively. No they aren't, you see how flimsy they are size 4 and up. It's a completely different fucking diaper. Homelander continued. She and Golden Boy took a seat at the far end of the table. I can see this. And so can the fucking customers. You weren't the one that was just assaulted by a Korean grandmother in a grocery store and berated for 10 minutes on changing the damn diapers. Homelander said and threw the diapers in his hand on the table. Josh looked repentant, ashamed inside. We still have to take it to Ashley. This could cost us quite a bit depending on how we handle it. You let me worry about Ashley. I'll get in touch with her after she lands. Ashley was gone to deal with some issues with the park in Hong Kong, Dina remembered. Josh nodded and left the room, leaving them with Homelander. Where the hell is everyone? It's all Almost 10 past. He said as he turned to them, I've got 5 launches to do today. And first one starts at 11. Before she could answer the door opened with deep rushing in phone in hand. Shell, did you see the video? The deep went straight to Homelander. What video? Golden Boy asked. Shit it's out already. Homelander asked leaning in over the deep. Both her and Golden Boy joined him. They saw a portrait phone video of an old Asian lady yelling at Homelander in a grocery store while holding two small boxes of diapers. The words were explicit and embarrassing. Wow, Dina couldn't help but say, that old lady is really letting you have it. Fuck. And all I wanted was to buy some damn Gatorade. They all looked at him. I like the taste. 
He said rolling his eye. So the previous meeting was about this video? Golden Boy asked. Yes. Yes it was. Now never mind that. Where the hell is everyone else? Are they online? Dina saw him go start the TV screens. I thought everyone replied to be into Dash. The door burst open again. Did you guys see the video? A train burst in. Ajuma vs Homelander. The Deep asked. Yay old feisty Korean lady. That is going mad viral. A train said. Not a good look. He said with an amused smile. Dina could see Homelander was getting annoyed now, differently than his previous frustration. Yes, they saw the stupid video. Now why are you late? He asked annoyed. No, how are you late? You're the fastest man alive. A train looked sheepishly and said, I may have stopped for an extra bagel in the cafeteria. Oh for fuck's sake, where the hell are Starlight and Noir? It's almost a quarter after Dash Homelander was interrupted by his cell phone ringing. It's Ashley. He said and took the call. Hey Ashley. Yes. I saw the stupid fucking video. Dina saw him pause and heard rapid fire talking from the other side. So you just talked with product and legal. No, no, I don't care. We talked about this before. He continued while pacing. Dina could tell Ashley was trying not to lose her shit on the other side of that line. I don't give a shit how much it's going to cost well. He said and turned back to them holding the phone down to his chest. I've got to go. He simply said and headed to the door. Where? I'm going to pull them out of whatever meetings they are in now so they can tell me that to my face. He said doing everything he could not to fully shout in the phone. Dina could see Starlight just turning the corner coffee cup and laptop in hand. Homelander bumped into her making her spill a bit of the coffee on herself. Captain get your fucking team in order. Dina heard Homelander say without skipping a beat or stopping at all. No Ashley I don't care. Dina heard him say as he rounded the corner. What the hell was that? Starlight asked confused as she entered the room. What's up his ass and where is he going? She made a move to get the napkins in the middle of the table. Before any of them could answer the conference room door burst open once more. Noir silently strode in one hand holding his phone and the other pointing at it. Starlight looked even more confused. You have to watch this video, the deep said. Date, October 2023. Ryan looked at his father with skeptic eyes, while a cocktail of emotions were bubbling up inside of him threatening to burst. Anger, hate, sadness, betrayal were prominent, and while coursing through him along with a million thoughts a second in his head, he felt most of all being weirded out, and somewhat awkward. Dad even I know it's super weird to pay someone to be my friend at school. He finally said after his father finished his explanations. He stole a look at David and felt the awkwardness overcome him. He felt a bit of envy of the older boy being so cool with the situation. I'm not exactly paying him to be your friend. His father replied. But it would be nice if we could continue to be friends. David interjected with a smile. At first he felt jealous when his father brought the speedster along to train and spend time with them. The older boy was just better than him at almost everything their dad made them do and he made it seem so effortlessly. He picked up Noir's martial arts training faster, aced water rescue simulations with Deep, and always knew what to say in the de-escalation scenarios, with Starlight and Silver Kincaid. Not to mention how well he did in speed training with A-Train. Ryan thought Blink might even be faster and better than A-Train himself. The older boy was always in control of his speed, and never seemed to have a wasted movement, a testament to his moniker Blink. Cause if you blinked you miss him. Every task his dad gave them he made it look easy, cool and effortless. And Ryan hated it at first. It didn't take long for Ryan get absorbed into the older boy's good nature. David was quite funny, always seemed to be smiling and with a sincere openness that spoke to Ryan. The older boy also helped him was able to explain things in a way that Ryan understood. Even more importantly than that Blink was able to go his speed both figuratively and literally, and he liked the same books, games and videos like him. Ryan felt like he had connected with David in a way he had never connected with anyone else. He had thought he had made his first friend, and now his father was revealing it was all a ruse, and he was going to get paid for it. But you're paying him to come and hang out with me at school, to watch over me. He trailed off. No Ryan, that is not what I said. Homelander started again. I was actually going to give David a scholarship all the way through college, even if he did not agree to my deal. I had already discussed this with his parents. As for watching over you his father hesitated a bit as if thinking about the right words. What I mean is, and I don't want you to take this the wrong way. Son and it's not that I don't trust you or anything like that it's just that it's always best to have a contingency plan. His father paused slightly again. Always. So that's why Blink is going to be your contingency in case you lose control of yourself and your powers. Ryan looked at his father with wide scared eyes while an anxious knot filled his chest. You you don't trust me. He said slowly. You don't think I can handle school. His voice almost a whisper. He had asked his dad to let him go to school like a normal kid. His whole life he had been homeschooled either by his mom directly or tutors. He never understood why he couldn't go to school like the kids he saw in movies. 
though at the time he really had no idea how special he was. He had always dreamed of it. And after the accident with his mom and Stormfront, he had resigned himself that he would likely never go. He did not want to accidentally hurt the other children. But after moving in with his dad, they had practiced their powers relentlessly, and he was confident he had everything under control. And now his dad was admitting that his hard work was not enough. No son, that's not it. I trust you. I trust you would not ever use misuse your powers or lose control in almost any type of situation. His father said putting a hand on his shoulder. They were in the living room of the apartment in Vault Tower. Hell, I know I could throw you in a hostage situation right now, and I'm confident you'd be able to save them all, and even stop the terrorists non-lethally. Homelander said and Ryan felt a surge of pride swell up in him. But school Ryan is a totally different beast. He said and grimaced. Kids can be real pricks anything and everything, and they are relentless. His father continued. And for people like us, well you know the saying sticks and stones can break my bones but words can never hurt me. Ryan nodded still wide-eyed looking as his dad. Well for people like us it's almost like the opposite sticks and stone can never break our bones. But words can always hurt us kind of. His father looked at him with concern in his eyes. Kids will lie about, pick on and make fun of anything and everything. They can be real pricks sometimes and drive you insane dot not you of course son. His father finished off. School couldn't be that bad, could it? Sure he'd seen bullying in movies. But that was always exaggerated right. In 5th grade this girl in my class Farrah stepped on some bubble wrap that made a popping noise. Making it sound like she farted. Blink said. For the rest of the year everyone called her farting Farrah. It was pretty brutal. It got so bad she switched the school in the district over in grade 6. But this other guy Andrew in my class mate his cousin went to that school. So they eventually found about farting Farrah. And called her that as well. Rumor goes she eventually went to live in California with her uncle's family. David said with a shrug of his shoulders. Both Ryan and Homelander starred with wide eyes at Blink. Right, well I'm not saying that will happen to you Ryan, but in the case you do get into a situation where your emotions will get the better of you, because of whatever kids might say or do, hopefully David will be able to reach you in time, and minimize damage. I see, Ryan said understanding better. He knew from training that David was strong and fast enough to restrain him at least on the ground. Plus it would be nice if we already knew someone at the school, even if we are in different grades. David said, It's always hard for kids to make friends when they join late. We can at least eat together in the cafeteria and bitch about our roommates. He said with a smile. Oh and sorry for the language sir. He said sheepishly. Ryan just saw his father give Blink the look the one, where he was not buying it one bit. Okay dad I think I get it. He said getting back their attention. He felt better about the situation still he felt compelled to ask. But what about if David loses it? It's true. I could also lose it. David said with another shrug. But pranks are more my style, rather than wanton violence. But yay can't say some guys don't get under my skin. Well Ryan that's when it will be up to you to step up and stop him. I know you can do it despite what you may think. His dad said calmly. You two will have to watch over each other and keep an eye out for each other. Ryan felt another surge or pride within him. On the ground David was better than him. But in the air he was master. Plus he was pretty sure he was way tougher than the speedster. And if we both lose control. It's true sir. What if we both mess up? Blink asked calmly. Well we cannot plan for every eventuality. There will always be that risk. Homelander said standing straight hands on his hips. We have to deal with what we can and cannot do and continue on striving for the best. If that happens we simply have to deal with the consequences. But hopefully it won't come to that. He finished calmly. Ryan looked at his dad for a bit in silence contemplating. Okay dad I get it. I'm not upset anymore. So still friends. David asked extending his hand and Ryan couldn't help but smile. Yay friends. Cool. We're gonna have so much fun. The Maya school is like so much better than my shitty school in San Diego. They have an actual pool and a cheerleading team. David said excitedly and put a hand over his shoulder. Oh we should finish Baldur's Gate before we go. I don't think they'll let us bring our consoles. Ryan felt that even if he ended up not liking school at least he would still be able to hand out with David, so it won't be so bad. Date. December 2023 Meve took a swing of her cocktail glass, and downing the remaining contents, and in one smooth motion, put the glass down on a passing waiter's tray. Meve good to see you. A train said as he walked up to her and leaned in for a hug and kiss on the cheek. I see you're finally getting a break from well everyone. Not anymore I'm not she replied with a mischievous smile leaning into the hug. It wasn't hard to admit to herself that she had missed being out at a party with without having to worry about anything. Motherhood so far had been everything everyone had ever warned her rewarding. Hard work, stressful, joyous and frankly exhausting. Even for someone like her when you added the additional work of being Vort's NR. One super mommy things got too much. So tonight she was going to enjoy this New Year's gala, even if it was a Vort event, and she would have to deal with the usual bullshit. 
Where's little Connor tonight? He asked gently. Elena's parents are babysitting. She said stealing a look at her lover across the room talking with a group of people. Nice, you guys finally get a night out. A train started and paused slightly. Hey listen sorry for not visiting yet. Things have been crazy busy around here. And I figured you guys probably wouldn't want don't worry. I know, she said in understanding. With everything going on it's honestly easier if people visit less. Between our parents, friends and all the crap I have to do for Vought on the weekends well, sometimes less is more. She replied rolling her eyes. Plus we got your gift that was very nice and more than enough. How's your recovery going? She asked curiously. Honestly, good, real good. She saw him both excitedly and with a tone of tension. Why are you saying it like it's not a good thing? A train looked around the room as if looking for something, then conflicted. Homelander me thought. He was looking to see if Homelander was around. It wouldn't matter if he was listening he could hear them a mile away if he wanted. No, it is a good thing. I'm good better than ever even faster. My heart is strong and has adapted to my body as if it was the original. At first I thought it was all due to my powers. But I think it might be something else they gave during the operation. Another server passed by, and both Meeve and A-Train picked up a new round of drinks. New V. She asked taking a sip. Maybe. He said and took a swing of the colorful liquid. I don't know for sure. He took another sip. I know HL has the nerds working on some life-changing stuff I just thought it was years away. But I think he might be closer than I thought. He sipped again. But you said you're okay. Yay. Like I said better than ever. So why the apprehension? She asked confused. Honestly I don't know. Her teammate finally said. Things have been going well too well honestly. He said deflated. It feels like something bad is about to happen. Or that like Homelander is preparing us for something. I honestly don't know what it is. Meeve was starting to get an idea of what was bothering A-Train. She talked somewhat regularly with Annie to keep up to date on the ongoings of the team. But really to keep track of Homelander. She knew there had been a lot of changes in the past year in the company. As she was there for the beginning of some of them. The space venture kept Homelander busy certainly. But it wasn't only the big changes that were noticed it was the little ones. Homelander had slowly but effectively relinquished control of the Seven to Starlight, making her sole captain in all but name. She knew from their talks that even though he gave his input in the end, it was Starlight's decisions that were actioned and ideas implemented. Now that she thought about it, Neve wasn't sure if Annie had noticed this or not. She had seemed happy to lead and have her ideas come true. Either way she did notice that in the past year and the last six months specifically things had been abnormally normal in a corporate 9 to 5 job type of way. Perhaps, she finally said, maybe he's scheming something, she said contemplatively. Or maybe things have just gotten to how they should have always been and would just not used it. She shrugged her shoulders. I hope so. A train said downing his drink. Seems like Elena is still caught up in her conversation. Would you care for a dance? He continued with a happier attitude. Meeve stole a look at a laughing Elena talking with friends and accepted. Come one. She said grabbing his arm and taking him to the dance floor. I know you're only asking me for a ratings bump. But you better bring your aim of us and keep up. I've been itching to let loose for the last six months. A train fate betrayed look as he put his hand over his heart. What? Me a ratings bump. Why I would never. He said with a big smile. And you know I bring my A game every time. Neve couldn't help but smile. Whatever it was Homelander was planning. She thought while bumping to the beat, she would do whatever it took to keep Elena and their cute little bundle of joy safe and happy. Date. December 2023 Starlight smiled and laughed as sincerely as she could at the older man's joke. She did just as everyone in the group did. She had no idea if they were all sucking up like her or being sincere. But in the end she thought it didn't matter. It was just a simple fact of life that when you were worth billions, people laughed at your jokes good or bad, and if they wanted your money they laughed extra hard. The Vought New Year's Gala was both a party and a charity event. A great opportunity to raise money for her foundation Home Light, well her and Homelanders technically. The foundation was her baby in reality, making the best she could out of the social media hashtag and couple nickname, and using that fame to help homeless and at-risk youth. And isn't that the irony she thought? Out of all everything that had happened in her life, the good and the bad and the fucked up, in the end, it was being Homelander's fake girlfriend that allowed her to actually do good and change people's hearts on a massive scale. Excuse me, gentlemen, she felt a warm hand on her arm. Mind if I steal my girlfriend back for a few moments? Homelander said. The sensation of his hand on her skin made her heart flutter. Not at all. A chorus of responses affirmed. Hey, what's up? She said following him. Nothing, just thought you could use a break. He said with a sly smile. How's it going so far? She wanted to scowl. Oh nothing, just working on the Rogers. She said and paused. You could have warned me about Silverman. Oh yay he's a little bit handsy. He said. A little bit. 
More like a lot. The man practically cupped my ass while dancing. She said annoyed. Yay. He snorted in laughter. It's more like a lot. But don't worry his wife is just as grabby. I can already picture the headlines tomorrow. Homelander dumps America's sweetheart for older woman. Gets freaky on the dance floor. America's sweetheart and Homelander's girlfriend. Oh the irony. Still she could not deny the results. She knew for sure she had saved and changed more people's lives in the last year. With her foundation that she ever did physically as Starlight. That bad. She asked. The foundation started as Starlight House for Homeless and At-Risk Youth, which eventually was gobbled up by the broader Homelight Foundation, in collaboration with Homelander, which was expanding in everything from running local food banks in New York to helping veterans and sick kids. Overall a wide variety of services were being funded by Homelight. Like an old hungry slobbery wet, she practically liked me head to toe, except instead of food she wants well he said, raising his eyebrow. Honestly if number metu was still a thing I'd be tweeting it right now. She actually laughed at that. Their friends had of course donated with surprisingly Homelander himself at first, contributing the largest chunk at 20 million, Vought of course, was roped in with some shareholder money. But really it was post the whole soldier boy ordeal, when the money really started to roll in. The savior of New York he'd been called. Yikes, sorry you had to go through that. She still hurt when think about it. All that death and suffering, families destroyed all because of an obsession to do whatever it takes to kill Homelander. She had felt like there was blood on her hands because she wasn't able to stop it, and because of you. Oh, the irony she thought again. Now it was that same man she thought to kill that was helping her wash the blood off. Well, it did secure another 10 million donation, so at least something good came out of it. Homelander had changed. That much was obvious. But it was much more pronounced after supposedly almost dying. Come on. He extended his hand. Let's dance. He said as a slow song came on. She took his hand and closed in as his hands went to her waist. He was different, calmer, warmer and more charming. Just when she thought she thought she had him figured out he did something different, something better, something that spoke to her. He supported her ideas and change initiatives. And because of that so did the rest of Vought. They had even used Vought news to expose corruption instead of simply spewing out fear-mongering news. They actually help people now. Every day she waited for the hammer to drop, for Homelander to take it all away to rip it all away from her. And yet every day passed and nothing happened. You know what I think. He said slowly leaning into her as they swayed to the rhythm. I think we should give the press something else to talk about. If anything it seemed Homelander seemed to be distancing himself from the Seven, though, she thought, that could also be a simple fact of him being too busy with being Vought Chairman and dealing with the V-Light. He smiled mischievously and pulled her in, their bodies now gently touching. A little spark went up her spine and her heart fluttered in response. Homelander had changed. That she knew for sure as she looked up at him and leaned in, lips parted, meeting his. She just wasn't sure when she had changed. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.